the great Seminar 13. Uh, so, uh, so I'm happy to uh, talk with you today about Syria. I am wearing this lovely vest of Damask, and you all said, ah, aha, he got it in Damascus, and, and I did uh, some years ago. So I thought I would wear it in honor of the, of the topic. Um, I lied to you in my subtitle because I don't actually know what we should do in Syria. Uh, uh, and so I know I'm going to lose half the audience right now, but uh, uh, I'm like everybody else. I know lots of choices we could make, but I'm not sure that any of them will really produce an outcome that we will be happy with. So what I'm going to do in a, in a fairly short period of time is take you through uh, kind of, for those of us that had the five-minute university yesterday, kind of the five-minute or maybe 15 or 20-minute uh, Army War College, what we do here, what we consider here, what we ask the students to look at here, applied to the Syria situation. I'll take a few minutes and talk about Syria also. Uh, and then at the end, I'll sketch out our options and mostly show you how all the options are pretty bad. So to begin with, the students have all seen this before, you know, uh, pictures of me uh, and my credentials. My credentials are basically that I've worked on this part of the world for a long time in lots of different places and ways. Uh, the picture at the bottom, I was with the Mujahideen in the 1980s. That was from the tribal area of Pakistan going into Afghanistan. Um, picture at the top uh, in the Ibn Tulun Mosque, perhaps some of you have been there, in Cairo, one of the older uh, mosques uh, in Cairo in the Middle East. Uh, and along the way, uh, a lot of uh, study on, uh, on the Arab world, on the broader uh, world of the U.S. Central Command, the Middle East, to include Afghanistan and Pakistan, and travel in lots of places, including uh, in Syria. Now, I want to give you two basic con uh, concepts to start with to, to, to do what I said, which is talk about you know, U.S. Army War College and, and what we focus on. One is this concept that the students this year, uh, what, what did we call it this year? VUCA. No, not VUCA. We called it complex, complex ill-defined. Ill yeah, all right, or complex ill-structured <laughs> problems. The literature originally called this wicked problems, and I like that better because it sounds cooler. Uh, and also, it's just easier for me to remember. These are, according to Rittal and Weber, difficult or impossible to solve problems, in part because they are complex, ill-defined, uh, ambiguous, there are multiple stakeholders with contradictory views, and not least because these problems lack stopping rules and tend to be mutating. And I won't go into all the detail. Just to, just to say that these are the kinds of problems that we want the students here to prepare to deal with. Because if they are easy problems, someone lower in the chain of command can normally deal with them. The other thing we talk about, perhaps you've already talked about it in your seminars, is what is strategy? We talk about strategy here. You see a definition up there, right? Strategy is the calculated relationship between ends, ways, and means. You see it in the middle of that pyramid up there. At the top, you see politics, which drives policy, which we also talk about here. Policy is a government's broad position on a particular issue. And you've probably also heard from the commandant on down that a lot of the students you've met here come to us with a wealth of tactical and operational experience in the military arena primarily, and we are preparing them for service at the strategy and the policy level thereafter. So I wanted to give you those two concepts. And then I also want to talk about Syria very quickly in the context of the Arab Spring or the Arab awakening, or, or there, there are a range of terms for this now. But that, of course, is the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the sweeping 
demonstrations and protests that happened across the Arab world, Middle East more generally, but especially the Arab world, uh, starting in mid-December of 2010 and going on uh, still today, especially in the context of the Syrian civil war. Some have described this perhaps as another springtime of nations or autumn of nations, if you remember those historical events. Uh, more recently, Tom Friedman has said, well, maybe Syria suggests that it's actually more similar to the Thirty Years' War, which is a much more troubling uh, historical uh, model. And then you see I put up there some of the key events that happened uh, in the Arab Spring. I'm talking very fast, by the way, for me, because I'm from North Carolina. We talk kind of slow normally, but I'm talking very fast because I don't have much time. So this was President Obama's response in the early days of the Arab Spring to the events of the Arab Spring. This was the policy guidance, OK? These core US interests in the Middle East, he articulated in a well-known speech at the State Department in Washington. And he articulated these six core interests. Countering terrorism stopping the spread of nuclear weapons, securing the free flow of commerce or oil, okay, regional stability, safeguarding the security of the region, standing up for Israel's security, and pursuing Arab-Israeli peace. Most of these are fairly familiar to us from our lifetimes. This is specifically what he said with regard to uh, the Arab Spring. People want self-determination consistent with US values and interest. And then he laid out a series of things underneath that. You can ignore all of that, but look at the blue at the bottom. Because this is another issue we talk about here. And General Hayden actually talked about it to, to you folks yesterday afternoon. What happens when your values and your interests kind of collide? What do you do then? OK. President Obama has consistently tried to link these together in his response to the Middle East, for which I commend him, but it's an uncomfortable uh, uh, linkage, I would, I would submit to you. Now, I said ends, ways, and means, so I thought I would give you a quick chart on this. At the top, under ends, and you may not be able to read that in the back, President Obama said in April of 2011, we strongly oppose the Syrian government's treatment of its citizens, and we continue to oppose its continued destabilizing behavior, including support for terrorism and terrorist groups. The US will continue to stand up for democracy and the universal rights that all human beings deserve in Syria and around the world. OK, as with most policy guidance, it doesn't give us very much. We're against this. OK, we're against this. So what are we going to do? to realize a strategy from that policy guidance. We have ways and means, the other pieces of our strategy equation, right? And the ways we typically talk about here, just as a useful sort of shorthand, as falling into the category of the dime. Perhaps some of you talked about that in some of your seminars. Diplomatic, informational, military, economic, ways of doing things. So we can send the military, attack the Assad regime. That would be a way, right? Uh, or we could send Secretary of State Kerry, right? Make an agreement with the Russians like he did recently. That would be another way. And the means, of course, refer to the money, the troops, the diplomatic personnel, uh, et cetera, that we might do things with. So I just wanted to to give you all of that by way of introduction. Now, very quickly, let me talk a little bit about Syria. Um, with apologies to Hajar Ismail, my Iraqi Kurdish student who insists that Erbil is the oldest conti uh, continuously inhabited city in the world, uh, and the archaeologists debate this point. Some say it's Damascus, others say it's Aleppo. Uh, but in any event, we have uh, a very old country here, 
in the sense that it's an old civilization that's only actually been independent since 1946. And its independence, because it was carved out like Israel, initially Palestine, Jordan, initially Transjordan, Lebanon, all right, it was carved out of the old Ottoman Empire in the period after World War I and up to World War II. And you'll see that that created some artificiality in this region as well that is borne out in particular in the divisions between religious and ethnic groups uh, that uh, General Hayden talked about yesterday when he talked about, uh, in particular, the division between Sunni, Shia, Christian, and also some of the smaller uh, religious groups that exist within Syria. I also put up a population chart there for you just to remind you of what all of my Middle East students here have learned ad nauseum this year, which is that the population of the Middle East is very young. Okay, and you can see these, the, the population chart for Syria there on your left with a sort of pyramid shape, a big base, a lot of young folks, versus the population of the United States on the right. You see where folks like me and most of you uh, fall into that category, which is further up the, the, uh, the age range on the chart. Now, the other thing I want to say, my second slide about Syria, is that um, it is a country that has had a brittle political system. Look at all the coups there. Syria actually leads the world this is a sort of dubious thing to lead the world in, in coups and coup attempts uh, in the post-World War II period. I used to joke, my CIA folks never liked this joke, but I used to joke that in the 1950s, this is where we sent junior CIA agents to learn how to overthrow a government. But in fact, it's really only the Hosni uh, 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 al-Zaim coup, the first coup of 1949, where we definitely uh, uh, did that coup. Uh, most of the other coups, the question of who did it and whether we were involved is sort of, uh, is sort of uh, unclear. Uh, but in any event, this is a country that's had a very brittle political system, and eventually what we got was a Ba'athist dictatorship headed by the al-Assad family, okay, uh, Hafez and, and now Bashar al-Assad, uh, and centered on the Alawite version of the Shia minority that come from the coastal area uh, of Syria. I'm going to talk more about that in just a minute. Limited economic development. This is also, although it's a country that relies heavily on oil, like a lot of Middle Eastern countries, this is one of the have-nots of the Middle East. Okay, this is not an especially rich country. Annual GDP per capita down there at about $5,000 in purchasing power parity. Compare that to Qatar at $141,000, or the UAE at $75,000, or many of the oil-rich countries with small populations. Um, also, from an economic point of view, the creation of Lebanon and Turkey out of the old Ottoman Empire served to actually sort of isolate Syria. Historically, throughout history, greater Syria reached to the coast. It included Lebanon as part of the population. It included a portion of what is now Turkey, the sort of southern part of Turkey along the eastern Mediterranean coast. Uh, and, uh, and, and in carving out Lebanon and shaping the borders the way the international community did, Syria was sort of isolated economically from some of those coastal, uh, those coastal enclaves. So to that end, I'll show you a couple of maps of Syria. Here you see what uh, the general, this map's not so easy to see. Let's do it this way. Here you see what the general was talking about yesterday. You have the Alawite, and more broadly speaking, the uh, Shia community along the coast. You have this broader Sunni swath out uh, away from the coast and also away from where the population is very heavy. 
populations heavy from Damascus to Homs to Hama to uh, Idlib to uh, Aleppo. And again, historically, you had these linkages between you know, Latakia and Tartus and Tripoli and, and Beirut to these internal uh, cities that were uh, further in. So most of the population is here and then also along uh, the river valley that runs down uh, into Iraq. You have Kurds up here as part of the greater Kurdish population that's in Turkey and northern Iraq and in Iran. Uh, and then you also have Druze populations uh, and Christian populations uh, in this area uh, as well. Now, let me talk very quickly uh, about the chronology and contours of the war. I'm trying to do all this as quickly as I can, not to give the subject short shrift, but to allow us to have some time for questions and conversation. Protest in Daraa, which is a town right down on the border with Jordan, okay, uh, uh, happened in March of 2011, so right at the height, that was when we were all paying attention to my old stomping grounds, Midan al-Tahrir, or Tahrir Square in Cairo, when I taught at the American University there, my office was a block away. A lot of my students were former students, you know, were out in the square. And the world was focused on Cairo then. But, of course, the Arab Spring was happening elsewhere. Um, and it began to happen uh, uh, in, in, in Syria, uh, in Daraa, in, uh, in early 2011, uh, as well as elsewhere. Now, you'll remember who is here. Maybe, didn't I see Yahya in here somewhere? Yahya. What were they saying in Tahrir Square? They were saying, Ashab. Exactly. They were saying what? Translate that. Exactly. The people want to overthrow the regime. They were saying this across the Arab world originally, and they were saying it, of course, in Tunisia, and then they were saying it elsewhere. They were saying this in Syria as well. But in Syria, unlike, say, in Egypt, the regime said, okay, we're going to deploy the army because the army actually is overrepresented the small Alawite community. Remember what the general said yesterday about these different sort of contours of the war, you know, sort of uh, uh, pirating a, a bit of uh, Rami Khoury's analysis uh, from the Daily Star in Lebanon that sort of has laid out the five or the six wars. Actually, I don't mean that he stole that from him, but uh, sort of echoing that analysis. Um, so if you, if you look at Rami's piece or if you think about what the general said yesterday, you see that, okay, the response of the regime was not to try to do what Hosni Mubarak did or, 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 or what was done in Tunisia or what was done in Jordan or what was done in Saudi Arabia, but to fight uh, the protesters. And very quickly, the protest turned into civil war that has grown uglier and uglier. Now, I could walk you through some of the details of that, but I won't in the interest of time. Instead, I will say, Look at the sub-bullets under June 2011 to the present, protest turns into civil war. Now the contours of that war, or at least the broadest contour, is some 200,000 plus government and pro-government forces versus some 140 or so, 150 maybe or so thousand anti-government forces. It's more complicated than that, but I'll get to that in a minute. According to the latest figures, 80,000 killed, uh, uh, somewhere around 4 million internally displaced persons, people within Syria. Remember, the population was 22 and a half million. That's a heck of a lot of people. Uh, uh, a million and a quarter refugees. Most of the neighboring countries are tiny. How many folks you got in Israel? Maybe 8 million, right? Right? In, in Israel? I'm sorry, I'm looking at Archiam and thinking Ram. Uh, uh, so maybe eight, 8 million in Israel, right? Maybe 4 million in Lebanon? Maybe 6 million in Jordan? Now, Turkey, of course, is a 
far bigger country. I saw Orhan in here somewhere. What's Turkey? About 76, 77 million. So anyway, uh, uh, with the exception of Turkey, though, the immediate neighbors are small, and we got a million plus refugees in the neighborhood. I'm going to go over that in a minute. Increase in sectarianism, human rights abuses, war crimes, all of this has happened, chemical weapons, and then, of course, the regional spillover. We have had mediation efforts, and the A-team has been involved. I mean, Kofi Annan was the Secretary General, Lakhdar Brahimi, I worked with him to do the election in Afghan Afghanistan 2002. Uh, Lakhdar was the Special Representative, the Secretary General, a former uh, a deputy, uh, and now the uh, Special Envoy, and none of them have been able to uh, bring about an effective uh, mediation effort. So I've got now about six slides, I think, or maybe seven, that are just maps. I'm going to show you a couple of things, maps or charts real quick, and then I'm going to conclude with some slides on the subject. What should the U.S. do? And then you're going to be very unhappy with me because I'm not going to, but well, I'm going to do it anyway. So, uh, so this shows you the rebel activity as of March, the latest map I had on this. And you can see where different cities, Aleppo, the largest city in the country, is divided between uh, uh, Sunni uh, rebels, Kurdish militias, and government-supported, uh, uh, either government troops or, or government uh, supporters. Homs and Hama uh, also divided. Uh, Damascus has also, I mean, the capital has also seen street fighting and neighborhoods taken over uh, uh, by various uh, rebels. Not surprisingly, Latakia and Tartus in the Alawite enclave of the coast and the so-called Plan B uh, uh, approach of maybe ethnically cleansing the Sunni and the others out of there so that the Alawite regime has a fallback position, a rump state, uh, is going on there. But not surprisingly, they have uh, continued to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, defensible from the onslaught of the rebels. And then you see in the northern areas, especially in the Kurdish areas, uh, but also along the river valley of the Euphrates, you see uh, that there has been some uh, uh, areas where the rebels are, are dominant. Now, I also said that to say government and opposition was, you know, painting with too broad of a brush. Uh, picking sides, I wanted you to understand this challenge for the United States. There's the pro-government, I put here the pro-government, the opposition, uh, the Kurdish opposition, uh, uh, and then I put uh, non-Syria actors in bold, including Israel, which I put in a separate category, uh, and then these actors that support one or the other of these, uh, uh, these factions. The pro-government includes the Syrian Armed Forces, the Ministry of the Interior Forces, various militias like the Shabiha and the uh, Jaysh al uh, you have also Iranian-trained Syrians, and then these various uh, international actors, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and also in Syria now, fighting in Syria, but then also Iran, Russia, uh, and China. You'll note FTO after Hezbollah 1999. That means that in 1999, the U.S. State Department declared Hezbollah a foreign terrorist organization, okay, which means by law we can't aid them or do anything uh, with them. They are the people that we are trying to, you know, defeat in the war on terror, among the others, the other 50-odd that are on the list. You will note that also the Al-Nusra Front last year was declared an FTO, and uh, the Congregel, or the PKK, uh, as most people know of them, uh, the, the Kurdish uh, Workers' Party uh, in Turkey uh, have also been declared uh, an FTO. So all sides have FTOs in the mix, which makes it hard for us to say, okay, we're going to aid with lethal or non-lethal aid uh, one or the other of these organizations. So 
You see the list, uh, some of the list of Sunni opposition groups there, uh, the Syrian National Co Council, Free Syrian Army, and so forth. The Al-Nusra Front is uh, aligned with Al-Qaeda. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is more aligned with the historical Sunni opposition uh, in, in uh, Syria. Uh, and then you see the Kurdish groups down uh, at the bottom. I thought I'd just show you this. You won't have time to really read all this, even if you're close enough to make it out. But this shows you that it is more complicated even than I just described. Because there are lots of local groups, for example, in Deir Azur, uh, that, uh, that aren't really you couldn't say, oh, they are the Free Syrian Army. In fact, some analysts now say the Free Syrian Army doesn't have any meaning anymore. It's just a lot of small fronts and militias that are affiliated uh, under that label. You also have a number of internationals. The Libyans, Chechens, and Afghans are in that particular category that have come there because they see this as a war about the future of Islam. Uh, and not just uh, a, a war between uh, Syrians about the future uh, of their country and what kind of regime will be there. And we could go on about that. I also wanted to talk a little bit about regional spillover, and this map will be a little too uh, complicated. This is the latest one from the, uh, uh, from the U.S. State Department dated May 29th. And if you could read it, you would see, and I say if you could read it because I'm not sure you can, you would see that uh, we have uh, almost 500,000 Syrians in Lebanon now, 500,000 refugees, population of four, five, six million maybe, 500,000 in Jordan, similar population, I mentioned it earlier about 400,000 in Turkey, but keep in mind that a lot of the Kurds that have gone uh, uh, into refugee status go into Turkey because that's the border they live along, and that exacerbates the Kurdish issue that, uh, that exists uh, within Turkey. So, I mean, that's a general, uh, 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 a general situation of spillover and how that uh, creates problems within the region. Now, that's not the biggest problem to the U.S. government. Oh, these are armed shipments from various countries. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. This is the problem to the U.S. government, or at least President Obama talked about it, chemical weapons. Keep in mind, Syria Unlike Iraq, which, right, we went to war, weapons of mass destruction, turns out we didn't find them. Syria has weapons of mass destruction, has had for a long time. They have not signed the Chemical Weapons Convention or ratified it, never did, one of the few countries that uh, uh, never did this. They produce hundreds of tons annually of three major kinds of nerve gases, VX and sarin and taboon, the, the three big ones, plus mustard gas, which is a blister agent and a really nasty kind of gas. They did this, they always said, because Israel had weapons of mass destruction. Israel's never admitted to having weapons of mass destruction, but the world widely believes that Israel has nuclear, nuclear weapons and has had for uh, a number of decades. And so Syria has always tried to pursue nuclear weapons and chemical weapons, biological weapons, uh, in their, in, as they have always said, in response to that. Now, they have chemical weapons. President Obama said that if they use chemical weapons, and you probably just heard again uh, of an incident in the last couple of days, uh, that that would be a red line that would force U.S. intervention. Well, nu uh, nuclear uh, chemical weapons did get used, apparently. Um, and then the red line sort of became an orange line, maybe, or a yellow line. And the reason for that is because it was a false red line to begin with. The president was basically saying he was, you know, uh, writing a check that he, in the end he wasn't going to be able to cash 
and hoping that he could force them. But I wanted you to be aware of this before before I went to my last slide, which is actually my last slides. I don't know where that one came from. Uh, uh, which are these, all right? Which is, what can we do? But I, I'll start out with, why can't anything be done? Or maybe, maybe it would be nicer to say, why hasn't anything been done up until now? Now, the first reason that sort of supports these other reasons is sovereignty versus R2P. R2P is an acronym that's not a military acronym that we forced all of these good officers to study this year, which now, now they all know, actually they all knew anyway. What is R2P? Responsibility, Responsibility to protect, right? And it's, it's, a, it's a recent development by the UN and in international law that says, in effect, that governments have a responsibility to protect their populations. And if a government fails to do that, or, God forbid, actively starts to harm its population, that the international community, the other governments, have a responsibility to protect those people. We use this in the operation in Libya, uh, operation Odyssey Dawn, the no-fly zone that led to the toppling of the Lib Libyan government, uh, President Obama has uh, embraced this in the national security strategy, all right? But it does run into the traditional views of countries around the world that sovereignty means that within my borders, I get to decide what to do with my people. And the Syrian government has specifically and repeatedly said, this is a civil war, and yes, we are fighting rebels against the legitimate government of Syria, and therefore, responsibility to protect doesn't apply. Now, if you want UN Chapter 7 action, which means what, students, UN Chapter 7 action? Armed intervention. Yeah, armed intervention, right? A peacekeeping uh, uh, operation, or bigger than peacekeeping operation, an armed intervention. You need a Security Council resolution. But there's a problem with that, and that is the first sub-bullet. Russia and China oppose action against the Syrian regime. I know Russia just agreed to something with Secretary of State Kerry. I also know uh, when someone is dragging something out, uh, and, and that's what Russia's been doing. China also opposes action against Syria regime, not because China has a long, important military relationship or geostrategic relationship with Syria, but because China uh, uh, opposes, in general, uh, uh, um, these kinds of things that would threaten sovereignty for fear that it might affect them at some point. Iran supports the Syrian regime because the Syrian regime has an Alawite or Shiite base, uh, and Syria is part of its broader uh, Shiite strategy in, in the Middle East, Hezbollah, which is the Shiite organization based in Lebanon, supported by Iran, also supports the uh, Syrian regime for the same reason. Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Turkey all support the Sunni opposition, but typically they support different bits of the Sunni opposition. They have some different sort of proxies that they are, that they are working through uh, within, uh, within Syria. And then you see some of the rest of the pieces of the puzzle there, the Lebanon piece, the Israel piece, the Iraqi Kurdish piece, and then the US red line or whatever line uh, over chemical weapons use. So I wanted to give you some solutions to end with, and I thought I would look to my seniors, my, my political leaders, and I found that they were all over the map, too. As we all know, Senator John McCain, God bless him, just went to Syria. He was up there in the north along the Turkish border with the rebels. He favors the Syria Transition Act to provide lethal, non-lethal aid to Syrian rebels. Perhaps some of you saw him on the Sunday shows this weekend. He also believes we should supply heavy weapons 
and, and create and patrol a no-fly zone in Syria, even if Russia has provided the weapons by which our planes or our unmanned aerial vehicles could be shot down. Now, his colleague in the Republican Party in the Senate, Senator Rand Paul, gearing up for a presidential run perhaps in 2016, uh, opposes aid to the Syrian rebels. Um, Secretary of State Kerry, I gave you a quote from him uh, with regard to the prospect of Russian arms sales to Syria, which would be used to shoot down American or other aircraft uh, that might want to patrol a no-fly zone. But my favorite is the old man. Henry Kissinger just turned 90. He's still going, well, you know, he's still, he's still, uh, I just saw an interview with him the other day, and he's still sharp as a tack. But look at what he said. I gave you two bits from him. Back uh, in December, he said at the uh, Wall Street Journal editorial board meeting, I think it was, he said, the U.S., if the U.S. is no longer the world's pre preeminent power, then the U.S. must establish priorities. Ooh, the old real politic uh, is emerging from the old, uh, the old man. What he wrote back in August of 2012 uh, is another expression of this, that this is a struggle for power between the Alawites and the other uh, Syrian minorities, to include the Christians, by the way, and the Sunni majority that the minorities fear. In other words, Iraq or Lebanon kind of all over again. And that the best thing we could do is stay out of that. And so, I'll give you one more little bit of information. Public opinion. I just looked at the last Gallup poll a day or so ago on this of the U.S. public, 58% of us said that economic and diplomatic tools would be insufficient to resolve the Syria conflict. Where clearly, by our own uh, 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 policy choice, responsibility to protect would apply. We should do something because U.S. values say we should do something. And the president, moreover, has committed us to do things in support of our values. But 68% of Americans say we shouldn't intervene even though economic and diplomatic tools are insufficient to the task. So don't use the military, or one would assume that maybe even includes covert means like we once did when we were overthrowing regimes in Syria, or at least we did once. I, I won't talk about any of the other ones. So what about the other uh, the other factors for you to consider, regional sectarian violence worsening, uh, the no-fly zone idea is dangerous uh, since uh, the Russian anti-air missiles uh, have come into the equation. Uh, uh, aid is hard to program so that it doesn't end up in the hands of foreign terrorist organizations or other anti-US groups. The Syrian regime controls large quantities of chemical weapons. We, and frankly, the Israelis, are not so worried about Assad having those chemical weapons, but we are worried about those weapons sort of leaking out into the hands of some of these other groups. And, you know, the old rule of politics, right? You scratch my back, I scratch your back, right? So we can't get a UN Security Council resolution unless we're prepared to give something significant to Russia or China, apparently. So, what should the U.S. do? This was the slide I was going to prepare to end on where I told you what we should do. And when I told my wife yesterday or the day before, I said, I got nothing. Uh, I don't have an answer. She said, well, then you better tell the people that. So that's what I'm telling you. We could do these things. Well, we could do the first two anyway, and we are doing the first two. We are strengthening relations with the Friends of Syria group uh, and with uh, the key neighboring countries like Jordan and Lebanon and, of course, Israel and Turkey that, and uh, the Iraqi government to the extent that we can, certainly the Kurdish government in the north of Iraq. 
Uh, we are providing uh, humanitarian assistance to the refugee populations and to those countries like Jordan and Lebanon that have the large numbers of, of refugees. The other stuff, though, comes with but, right? We, we could provide non-lethal aid and limited lethal aid to selected Syrian opposition, but can we really know who we're giving it to? I mean, if I give it to this nice gentleman here who's my good buddy, and he gives it to this guy right here who hates Americans, but right now they're like, yo, we're together because we're against Assad. Well, I remember when I was with the beard and the gun in Afghanistan, in that picture I was with Gulbuddin Hekmatyar's guys. So to my students, Where's Gulbuddin Hekmatyar right now on the U.S. wanted list? He's one of the bad guys, right? Actually, he was a bad guy then, too. But, uh, but anyway, we were with him then. So what happens when the war's over and now he's got the lethal aid? The guy who hates Americans or maybe hates Israelis or maybe hates, you know, yeah, some other group in the region that... Uh, so that's a problem there. We could use drones to create no-fly zones, right, in rebel-held areas or manned aircraft. What about what we did in Libya? Did we have no-fly zones or did we have some ground attack that happened in the, in the no-fly zones in Libya? Uh, uh, we're all probably old enough, well, not all of us, but many of us, to remember the term mission creep and to know that it often applies in these situations, these unintended or second and third order effects, unintended consequences. Anyway, all of those have a but attached. I didn't put a but with the last one, but let Syria burn, the sort of Henry Kissinger, the original Henry Kissinger option. But there's a big but attached to that one too. Right, because we're the United States of America. And yeah, uh, sectarian violence in the heart of the Middle East, in a region that has the oldest continuously occupied places in the world, in places that are turning to the US expecting us to provide leadership. What kind of leadership can you have if you don't lead uh, uh, in, in times of crisis? So there's a but attached to that one as well. And so I know this has been a very extremely unsatisfying lecture for all of you, but, uh, but as I've told my students throughout the year here, my job is to give questions uh, and not answers. And what I really mean by that is uh, what we try to do is we try to give you the, the, the shape of the problem so that you can think through it in a fairly informed way on the strategic level. So that's what I've tried to do. But I would be happy to take questions for the next like five or 10 minutes, and then you have to go back to your seminar rooms. So yes, sir. Dr. Goodbye. Yes. I just want to point out, you can't create a no-fly zone with drones. I, yes, I know. You put pilots at risk over top of security. I know that. I know that. But you could. You could use nuclear you, bad. You could do. What I really meant by that was rebel-held Kurdish areas <coughs> right along the Turkish and Iraqi borders. Now, it still wouldn't be perfect, but you could, you could make it somewhat safer there if you were prepared to put those, those uh, 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 anti-aircraft capabilities uh, uh, and anti-missile capabilities in uh, to support that. But Todd, I'm not, that, I got you. You're right. Yes, sir. How's yeah. that? Can you hear me? Okay, um, Ray Dunning, uh, Seminar 14. Uh, my question is, or a statement, uh, one, when the chemical weapons issue came up originally, and, and, and it's interesting to see um, the, the, the push behind it, because that would definitely get us involved. And so you heard some issues where there, there was chemical weapons apparently involved in, in, in one village. 
And then the UN inspector that's in charge of that comes out and says, well, and actually it was the opposition or one of those groups that used it, which would actually make sense that they would try to do that to get get other entities to move. So that's kind of dropped off the table, I think, a little bit. You haven't heard so much about it, but I think people want to use that as a as a tipping point for us. And then part B for this is that, you know, there we all read early in the thing, you know, give war a chance. And that the fact of the matter is the United States already is hated by all sides in there. And they already see us as involved in that. So that's something that we need to continue to consider. Whether we're involved or not, we still have our hands dirty according to that part of the world. Yeah, I'll just say very quickly, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, the chemical weapon, the original, uh, okay, chemical weapons apparently were used. It was then un inconclusive about, well, who actually did that and, and, and was it done by this side to make the other side look bad? And, uh, and we, we grabbed onto that like a drowning man and said, okay, we're not going to say that the red line has actually really been crossed, but it's probably a matter of time. On, a, on the second issue, though, um, that's a good point. Um, sectarian violence is, is, is worsening in Lebanon, in, in Iraq, throughout this region. It's a direct spillover of this conflict, and we can't stop it now, even if we intervene. Maybe we should have intervened earlier, now maybe we can't intervene in time to do that. But I wouldn't say necessarily that we shouldn't intervene at all. Okay, a bunch of questions. Let me go to this gentleman, this young lady, and then we'll go. Yeah, real quick, uh, I'll, I'll try to talk as loud as I can. Uh, do you think the, the Yeah, and that's also uh, the interesting thing. There's two things to that, and I didn't I didn't go into all the tactical situation just because it would take too long. But that's a good question um, because one of the the realities might be now that you go, oh, okay, we have to learn how to deal with Assad staying in power, and that that's that's the big gambit that that we're we're seeing two gambits being played. The sort of we're going to stay in power and we're going to make very clear that we are tied to Iran in doing so, right? Uh, because it's necessary. We tried to hide it, but we're gonna do it. Uh, and then secondly, we're gonna have the plan B option where if somehow, despite all of that, we lose, we, we've strengthened our fallback position uh, uh, on, the, on the coast. Uh, I think it's, uh, it has changed, uh, but then the, the issue that I was just sort of alluding to is, well, okay, um, then what do the supporters of the Sunnis and the Kurds do to change the equation in response to the influx of the Iranians uh, and the Hezbollah and the uh, Iraqi Hezbollah and so forth that have all, that have all uh, 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 come in there? So, I mean, that's, that's a very quick answer. I, I know there's almost no time. Yes, ma'am. That, that's another option that has been discussed. She didn't use the microphone, so for the folks that might be listening, uh, is there any way to sort of co-opt the Alawites and, and move uh, Assad out? That's been another possible solution, to get the Alawites to give up uh, Assad, to find him a way out. This has been part of both uh, Brahimi's plan and before that, Anand's plan, uh, that has failed because uh, everyone on that side uh, thus far, number one, they think they can win, but number two, 
they fear that if the, if there are cracks in that uh, regime, uh, 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 then the whole thing will will fall apart. Yes, ma'am. I said, and I'm sorry. These two. I'm going to try to get these two, and then I'll take people afterwards. Does the situation in Turkey have any effect whatsoever on uh, protecting Syria? I'm going to let you talk to the Turkish officer on that. It's actually. Uh, you mean the overnight, the recent uh, events in Turkey? I tell you what, I'm going to let you talk to Orhan about that. I would say no, uh, it's a different situation, but it, this is a, a region that's in sort of upheaval right now, so there's a, a yes in there as well, but it's really more of a different situation. Let me get your question, and then you can talk to Orhan. Thank you. Please put this situation, the Syrian civil war, in context of the Israel and Iran conflict over their nascent nuclear program and what you think Israel's key interest here and what they might be advising the United States that they would ideally like to see happen. Okay, I'm going to do that. Uh, I, I had the time wrong. I thought we went until uh, 1.30. Uh, it was actually 1.20. So what I'm going to do, and I realize I left your question on the table, but you got the expert right behind you. And anyone else who wants to hear the answer to that stay afterwards while she talks with Orhan and the rest of you also if if you want to go back late and and grab me I'll I'll do that let me just take this question as the last question though um, in fairness to all my colleagues and all the seminars um, that that's the big that's one of the big overarching elements in the sort of great game if I can use the term from the 19th century British-Russian rivalry in Afghanistan and Central Asia to sort of apply here. That's one of the big pieces that's in the background. But it's also in the foreground because, as we were just discussing, you have Iranians in Syria, you have a, a Syrian uh, a chemical weapons threat that the Israeli government was quite happy to have the, uh, believe it or not, to have Bashar al-Assad sort of controlling because he was predictable and fairly stable, brutal and bad towards his population, but he wasn't, you know, firing scuds tipped with chemical weapons at Tel Aviv, and that was all good. Uh, uh, the, of course, the Israelis are very concerned about what might happen if we get a, a, a sort of Syrian replay of the Iraq War, where the outcome of that is to have a pro-Iranian uh, 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 even stronger in the case of Syria, a uh, Shiite-dominate government that is uh, leaning towards Iran, uh, so that there is this swath of Iran dominance right up to the borders with Israel. So there's that. On top of that, you've got the Iranian pursuit of nuclear weapons, uh, or a nuclear program, they say not nuclear weapons, but, you know, for a country not pursuing nuclear weapons, uh, their, their neighbors and others in the world, like the United States government, the Israeli government, the Saudis, uh, everybody is concerned about this. Uh, and somebody has been assassinating uh, nuclear scientists in Iran. I don't know who, but I'm, I, I'm guessing if Mr. Netanyahu was here, we could ask him about that. Uh, and somebody, to include the U.S. government, has been programming uh, uh, viruses, computer viruses, to attack the nuclear capability uh, in Iran different ways. I won't go into all that except to say it's public record. So, you, you know, I mean, clearly this is a, a big concern. President Obama's policy position has been his policy about nuclear weapons in Iran, the U.S. will prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons. Our biggest ally in the Middle East and has been for many years is Israel, ever since Iran quit being our biggest ally in the Middle East, basically. Uh, and we are determined with Israel, which fears in an existential way an Iranian nuclear threat, uh, to prevent this. So the meltdown of Syria and the regional spillover of Syria, even though thus far it has been Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan, and Iraq that have been most directly affected, does have implications for uh, Israeli security and, and, or through the eyes of Israelis and the prospects of, a, of an Israeli-Iranian uh, uh, preemptive war or war over this uh, nuclear program. It, it's, that's another thing to lie awake at night and worry about if you're already worried about the Syrian situation. 
Listen, thank you all for your attention. I if you have questions and, and want to engage,